Well, thank you for the invitation. All the way back in my college years as a young Christian, I tried to talk to anybody who would listen about Jesus, and I learned uh, many different classic questions that people have about Christianity. I thought I had uh, learned some good answers, answers to pass on to others, and then uh, I started getting an unexpected response. I would quote something out of the Gospels that Jesus did or said, try to apply it to a situation at hand, and someone would say, well, you know that modern scholars understand that Jesus never actually did or said that. And all my good uh, training in church and with a parachurch organization on campus uh, left me ill-equipped to reply. I could uh, apply the Gospels to just about any situation, but if somebody said they didn't believe the contents were true, I was kind of stymied. So, in an overly simplistic way, the last um, 40 years, ouch, um, since I turned 18, yeah, that's when I started college, wow, that's a scary thought, um, have been an attempt to, uh, to come up with better answers to, uh, to that kind of reply, and a lot of other things as well. I have in your bulletin, hidden among several important pieces of paper, uh, a page of notes, should you care to follow along, have something to take away with you. If you are an overachiever, you can even add some notes of your own. But if that seems too much like school, then uh, at least you have something to take away. And I apologize, this is not a traditional sermon. I made sure that the people who invited me uh, weren't looking for that, and uh, this will feel more like a talk. Twelve reasons why I believe we can have great confidence in the reliability of the Gospels. The first simply has to do with the astonishing number of texts, ancient Greek documents and those translated into other ancient languages from the first centuries of Christianity up to the time when the printing press was finally invented in the 1400s. We have over 5,700, almost 5,800 Manuscripts, fragments of manuscripts in the Greek, add those of other languages, and the number swells to nearly 25,000. We have a, an unbroken tradition going back to the early second century. And the later you go, the more complete the manuscripts are that have been preserved, and the more numerous they are. The next closest number is that of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, which functioned almost like a Bible for many in the ancient Greek world where we have 2,500 manuscripts, but after that you're into triple digits and very quickly into double digits for just a handful of the most famous and well-preserved writings from the ancient world. Some read claims that are written of hundreds of thousands of textual variants. So many we can't count them all, but we have to realize how many manuscripts they're spread over. And we have to realize that the vast majority of them are mere spelling variations. And that of those that are significant, maybe only 1,200 or so make any difference in the slightest in the meaning of a text. And of those, most of our modern English translations will print in footnotes the three or four hundred that are the, the most significant. So there aren't any surprises. We know where 
the variations occur. And it's certainly fair to say that no Christian doctrine, no ethical mandate, nothing of significance to Christianity hangs solely on any disputed text. This evidence, however, can be overstated. I've heard people say, all this textual evidence, how can you not believe that it's true? All the textual evidence in the world doesn't prove that one word of it is true. It just proves that we have a 99 plus percent likelihood of knowing exactly what the original writers wrote. And that's important because if we didn't, there wouldn't be much point in going on to assessing its truth. But we have to go on. We have highly reliable copies of the text of what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the other scriptural writers wrote. But can we believe their story? I can't stop now. I have to go on to 11 more points. Classical historians typically ask the question next, can we determine who wrote an ancient document? Were the authors in a position, as point number two affirms, to report accurate history? The traditional claims that go back to the oldest documents that we have in existence are Mark, Luke, Matthew, and John. I put Mark and Luke first because they're fairly obscure characters in the pages of the New Testament. Mark was a part-time follower of both Paul and later Peter, but is best known for having deserted Paul and Barnabas midway through Paul's first missionary journey. If you were making up a gospel and wanting it to attribute it to somebody famous in early Christian thought to gain credibility for it, Mark would probably be about the 57th character or so from the pages of the New Testament that you'd pick, and I make that number up. Luke would be even lower on the list because his name only appears at the end of two of Paul's letters when he's sending greetings. He calls him his beloved physician, a medical doctor who accompanied him part-time on various journeys. You recognize that in the book of Acts because all of a sudden the narrator stops talking in the third person plural that they did this and they did that and says, and then we came to such and such a place and we saw and heard and did. Luke is revealing that he was along for that part of the trip, but still a fairly obscure character. Matthew, much better known, one of the 12 apostles, but yet perhaps next only to Judas who betrayed Jesus, not a likely candidate for falsely ascribing a fictitious gospel to because he was the former notorious tax collector working for the hated occupying Roman troops. It's really only John who has all of the right pedigree. Now if you know anything about a very liberal branch of modern biblical scholarship, you'll know that all of these assertions are doubted in different quarters, but even then, the assumption is, if it wasn't Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it was somebody who was a close follower of one of those individuals, and hence the attribution. What's perhaps more important than being able to pin down precisely if the tradition about who wrote each gospel is correct, is the period in time in which they were written, which is point number three. All four gospels were written during the first century of Christianity. Jesus died most likely in AD 30, so written within the first 70 years. And again, there's a debate, which if this were a university classroom, we could take time to delve into. Conservative scholars tend to date Mark to the very late 50s or early 60s. Matthew and Luke just slightly later in the early 60s. John probably to the 80s or 90s. More liberal scholars, well, you can see the dates. They're a little later. But comparatively, still within a remarkably short period of time, 
by ancient standards. Consider, by way of comparison, the life of Alexander the Great, who died in 323 BC, conquered more of the ancient Middle East than any of his predecessors. Some to this day would say he was the most astute military strategist ever, given the technology he had to work with of the day. And the oldest existing biographies we have of Alexander date from the late 1st and early 2nd centuries A.D. More than 400 years later, and yet from them and the nature of their writing and the agreements that they have independently with each other, historians can write long and detailed chapters and modern biographies and sections of world civilization's textbooks about what we can most probably know about Alexander. In comparison, the wealth of material relating to Jesus is remarkable and remarkably early. But all this presupposes point number four, that the gospel writers would have wanted to preserve accurate history. The charge is often laid that these were individuals who never thought about creating biographies of Jesus during his life or shortly afterwards. It was only when uh, the first generation was starting to die out that they realized it would be worthwhile to have a written record. But by then it was too late to have preserved everything they might have wanted to. We can focus the argument even more sharply. Some would say that uh, the disciples of Jesus believed that the world was going to end in their lifetime. That Christ had said some things that suggested he was coming back before all of them would die. And, and if you think the world is going to end, you don't spend your time writing history. Who would be left to care and to read it? But if you actually examine the claims in the Gospels, they never unequivocally say that anybody believed Christ had to come back in the first generation, merely that some thought it could happen. And that's been the lively hope of Christianity over the centuries. There's an interesting comparison here with a Jewish sect called the Essenes who lived at a site named Qumran on the shores of the Dead Sea, a kind of monastic community where we get the famous Dead Sea Scrolls from. And they believed that they could well be living in the final generation as well, especially in the first century. And yet kept records and kept documents that enable us to chart the history of the movement from probably just before 200 BC. So believing that the end of the world might come soon is not necessarily a barrier to keeping records. But then there's perhaps a more serious charge under this same heading. It's the observation that the Gospels are not dispassionate chronicles of events, they are theological documents. They are ideologically motivated. They are passionately committed to a cause and can't ideology often skew the way you remember and tell stories? Yes, it can. But it doesn't have to. And sometimes the very ideology that a person or a group is passionate about makes it all the more important that they tell the story carefully. Think about the uh, tragic events of World War II and the Holocaust and the slaughter of six million Jews in the hands of Nazi Germany. Some very committed Jewish historians have been oftentimes the people who have most carefully worked to preserve with meticulous accuracy what we can know about the lives and deaths of those individuals. It's those who are apart from the movement who often 
make some of the most outrageous revisionist claims suggesting that it's all been blown way out of proportion. The first Christians had significant reasons to want to tell the story correctly. They were fighting an uphill battle. A virgin birth, a resurrected body. I sometimes chuckle when people attribute these to primitive beliefs of 2,000 years ago. Everyone knew back then just as well as they do today that it takes two to conceive and that corpses stay in coffins. This was as much of a challenge in Jesus' world as it is in many parts of our world today. And so if the living eyewitnesses who could have debunked the ordinary claims of what Jesus did when and where, apart from the disputed miraculous bits, the movement would have died out in a heartbeat, would have been discredited. The gospel writers had powerful motives for wanting to preserve accurate history. But that doesn't mean they had the wherewithal to pull it off. Even if we take the earliest dates for Mark, we're talking about almost 30 years after the death of Jesus. <laughs> Shoot, you can't even get two people today to agree on everything that happened sometimes 30 minutes <laughs> after a traffic accident or whatever. How is that inspiring confidence? We have to realize that it was an oral culture. It was a day and time when a small minority of people were literate and could read and write, much less have enough money to afford scrolls that were expensive so that usually only the rich or groups collectively could own written documents. This was an era in which ancient cultures meticulously cultivated the art of memorization. Young Jewish children, especially boys, in a somewhat sexist age, were taught and encouraged to repeat, not only by their parents at home, but at the elementary schools and local synagogues that they attended from ages 5 to 13, large chunks of the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Christian Old Testament. There are stories of when a new copy of the Hebrew scriptures was finished by a scribe over a period of months, that to check it, to proofread it, it was given to the most venerated rabbi locally who had the scriptures committed to memory to check against his memory. And you say, wait a minute, I can't believe that people ever did that. Go to orthodox conclaves in Israel today and you can find living rabbis who have the scriptures committed to memory. How is that possible? You start very young. You repeat it ad infinitum. <laughs> we might be tempted to say ad nauseum. You put it to music. You put it to a meter. You chant it. You talk about it with your friends. You study it in school. The rabbis had a tradition that said, no one is competent to discuss a passage of scripture until they have it flawlessly memorized. Otherwise, you might unwittingly misrepresent that. I would love to bring that back to the church, but it's not going to happen. The gospel writers, the longest gospel they produced was about 20,000 words, the gospel of Luke. Greek school children sometimes had Homer's Iliad and Odyssey committed to memory, about 100,000, about 100,000 words each. This was child's play. This is what happened in my home, only for less significant cultural artifacts. As my girls were growing up, uh, 
There was a time when they had the entire librettos of Man of La Mancha, Les Mis, Fan of the Opera, and the collected works of Veggie Tales committed to memory. <laughs> and they didn't sit down to try to memorize them. You can guess how many times the CDs were played over and over and over again. Kids can do that. And with a little bit of effort, it sticks. But that can't be all that explains four Gospels, because they vary significantly from each other. Oh yes, there are places where they are verbatim the same. And the fact that Jesus' words would have originally been in Aramaic, a dialect of Hebrew, but were written down in Greek in the Gospels, means that most likely somebody translated them and where the Gospel texts run parallel, others copied and reused that information. But what about the places where they are different? Here we have to recognize my sixth point that the differences among the Gospels closely match the patterns of ancient storytelling. It was common for a small village, a neighborhood, a, a social club, a religious sect, a, a philosophical school, a symposium to regularly repeat the sacred or cherished traditions of that group in the public gatherings of the individuals belonging to it. But there was freedom given to the storytellers from one occasion to the next, depending on the amount of time, depending on the context, depending on the purpose of the gathering, to wax eloquent at length, to abbreviate, to be very selective, to arrange material topically and not just chronologically to paraphrase people's words. This was a, a world that hadn't invented a quotation mark or had any felt need for it. When we read that a certain character said such and such, it means this is the gospel writer or someone before him putting into their words in a different language what they understand Jesus or someone else to have said. The key is, is it true to the content? not is it a verbatim transcript. All of these principles took place in what scholars have called an informal controlled tradition. Guarded tradition where you memorize it, more informal but still controlled where there is the liberty to narrate with various parameters of freedom but also with fixed points that are non-negotiables, basic information that must remain the same each time. Is there any way to demonstrate that the gospel writers thought they were doing something like this rather than uh, writing a novel or what we might call historical fiction? I believe there is. Luke's first four verses sometimes called his prologue or his preface, demonstrate that he was following, that he believed he was following, a literary genre that most closely resembled the genre of the best and most reliable of other ancient historians in the ancient Middle East. Historians like the first century Jewish writer Josephus and the pre-Christian Greek writers, Herodotus, Thucydides, Polybius, all begin with even lengthier prologues that strikingly resemble what Luke says here when he writes that many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. We don't know how many many are, but it certainly included Mark, possibly Matthew, probably other shorter written documents that were used as sources to produce those larger gospels, maybe even the beginnings of some spurious and, and contrary traditions about Jesus. Just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first 
were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Coming from eyewitness testimony or those who were the authorized transmitters of the tradition, designated by the community as faithful people who could be counted on to preserve information intact. And then, verses 3 to 4, Luke describes his own distinctive stamp that he puts on his writing. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, probably his patron, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Luke does have an ideological purpose. He wants to commend the truth of the gospel. He wants to instruct Theophilus further. And out of all of these sources that he is aware of, he wants to put his unique stamp or order or progression of passages on things. But that's exactly what the best of other ancient historians said and did as well. Then we shift gears a little for the next two points. Many of these comments thus far have been responding to objections. How about some more straightforward positive evidence for the gospel's trustworthiness? How about the hard sayings of Jesus? No, I don't mean the ones that are hard to obey. That would be most of them. The ones that you wonder, why on earth were they left in? If the gospel writers felt free to leave them out. Like Luke 14, 26. Jesus speaking to great crowds who are following him. And he says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. How many here hate your family member? No, don't raise your hands. <laughs> Fortunately, there's a parallel in Matthew 10, 37 in a different context that probably explains what Jesus meant when he says, if, if, whoever, is not, uh, whoever does not love God more than father, mother, brother, or sisters is not worthy to be my disciple. That's challenging enough. I discovered this morning with the empty highways on Sunday morning, sadly. It took me 55 minutes to drive here from Centennial. That's just five minutes longer than it takes me to drive to focus on the family. I have never heard focus on the family talk about this text. That's pretty obvious. Who wants to talk about hating your parents if you're focusing on your family? It's a hard, difficult, embarrassing, awkward saying. It can be explained, but why didn't Luke just leave it out? Unless he felt some strong constraint to the tradition. Or what about Mark 13, 32, in which Jesus says, No one, not even the Son himself, in the limitations of his incarnate form, knows the day or hour of his coming, of his second coming. A handful of folks have been trying to know more than Jesus did ever since. <laughs> Bless his heart, Harold Camping. For those of you who remember about two years ago. Well, we can explain that. Jesus did adopt voluntary limitations on the use of his divine power while he was a human, but in an era that was increasingly magnifying and glorifying and exalting this Jesus of Nazareth, who they believe was now demonstrated to be Lord of the universe through his resurrection, it was awkward. Why not just leave it out? Apparently, the writers didn't feel free to, and many other examples could be given like that. But then there's also the topics that one might have expected to appear in the Gospels that don't. We might call them the missing topics. Take circumcision, 
for example. Okay, it's not on your top 100 of ethical dilemmas in life, ladies, or men. <laughs> but if you were an adult Gentile man in the first century, interested in Christianity, and one group of Jewish Christians was saying, but you also have to keep the 613 laws of Moses. And 612 weren't bad. But one fundamental initiation right left you in considerable pain for a while in a world without anesthesia. You might think twice. So much so that Acts 15 is all about a council that was convened to bring all kinds of people together to hash that issue out. And fortunately for those adult Gentile men, the answer was no, you don't have to. But why not just quote what Jesus said? That would have been authoritative enough to settle it. Apparently he never said anything. And nobody felt free to invent a saying of Jesus, as we're told by some so often happen, to settle the controversy. Same is true with the debate over speaking in tongues at Corinth. Chapters 12 and 14 of 1 Corinthians show how, how that issue, along with prophecy and their interpretation, threatened to blow the church apart. And 1 Corinthians is the letter where Paul, more than any in any other, regularly quotes or alludes back to teachings of Jesus. Why not on this topic? Apparently he had nothing to cite and didn't feel free to invent anything. For some people, it's item number 10 that is the most crucial one. Okay, granted, Christians might tell it straight, but It'd sure be nice if we knew what some non-Christians said about Jesus. Well, we do. There are approximately a dozen ancient sources that will shortly appear with names not always easily pronounced. And a book you can refer to if you want to see all of that testimony and its significance in greater detail. But here is the composite of what we learn from Jewish, Greek, and Roman non-Christian sources from the first couple of centuries after the life of Christ. He did exist, lived in Israel in the first third of the first century. He was born out of wedlock. As a young adult, his ministry intersected that of that with intersected with that of a man named John, who baptized people for the repentance of sins. He had a brother named James. He gathered disciples together who became his closest followers. Five of them are named. He worked wondrous deeds. But at least one Jewish tradition says he was a sorcerer who led Israel astray. The miracles came from a diabolical rather than a divine source. He regularly got into conflicts with the Jewish authorities over legal interpretations. And that led eventually to his being crucified during the time of Pontius Pilate, which means we can narrow the time frame to 26 to 36 AD. And yet, despite his death, was believed to be the Messiah, the expected Jewish liberator by his followers, was believed to have been seen resurrected from the dead, such that a community of his followers continued to gather weekly and eventually began to sing hymns to worship him as if he were a god. It's a pretty significant collection of information. Outside of the Bible, non-Christian sources. It's not nearly as large as the wealth of information we have in Scripture, but remember, this is a time when nobody imagined that Jesus of Nazareth had founded a religious community that someday would name more adherents than any other religion on the face of the planet. It's about what one would have expected from that time period. 
I sometimes see blog sites that give a list of about 10 or 12 first century writers that say absolutely nothing about Jesus. And they say, see, if Jesus had lived, he would have appeared in, in these people's writings. Well, it's worth taking the time to Google the names and find out who they were. One of them was a geographer. One of them was a botanist. One of them was Philo of Alexandria, who died in 50 AD in Egypt, probably before the stories of Christ ever reached there. And you go on down the list, and there isn't any reason to expect that any of those people would have talked about Jesus. But when you go to the historians, you at least find passing reference. Still, other people want rock-solid evidence. The evidence of the rocks. The evidence of archaeology. One can find large tomes devoted to simply the archaeology of the places and sites and confirmation of people that we find in the Gospels to say nothing of the rest of Scripture. And just a, a quick list of a handful of some of the most prominent discoveries, all of them within the last half century. The pools of Bethesda and Siloam, both referred to in the Gospel of John. An inscription bearing witness in Latin to Pontius Pilate as the prefect of Judea. A small bone box containing the remnants of a skeleton of some Jew named Johannan, we'd call him John, in which a piece of wood is nailed to the ankle bone, confirming for the first time that Roman crucifixion sometimes involved nails to the feet and not just to the hands. A boat you can see in a museum on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, nicely named the Jesus Boat, because they know how to bring in tourists. Nobody knows whose boat it is, but it is a first century boat, and it's the largest boat that ever was discovered back in 1986 when there was record drought on the Sea of Galilee. And you can imagine, just about with cramped quarters, 13 small men, and they all were small in the ancient world, mostly, fitting into that boat, bigger than anything we've known before. Caiaphas' tomb, the high priest in power, who read the sentence, sending Jesus to his death, discovered just in 1990. The ossuary or bone box of James, the brother of Jesus, controversy has surrounded it. We don't know for sure if it's authentic, but increasingly there are reasons for thinking it may be found just about 10 years ago. As recently, this comes under the much, much more heading. There it is. As recently as 2009, just before Christmas, people digging in and around Nazareth found the foundations of a first century home. Skeptics had said, you can find a few people living in this site 300 BC, 300 AD, there's no evidence it even existed in the first century. And then they found the evidence. Always remember when it comes to ancient documents, events, periods of history, the absence of evidence is seldom the evidence of absence. Most of all ancient history is lost and gone forever, and you'd expect it to be. But I want to end with the twelfth point, the testimony of other early Christian writers supports many remaining details. And I don't mean second or third or fourth century Christian writers. I mean people like Paul and James who wrote before the written gospels existed in the 40s and the 50s. When they quote or allude to what Jesus said or did. And they do frequently. It's not because Paul went to his friend Dr. Luke and said, can I borrow your scroll for a second and look something up? He hadn't written it yet. 
it has to be because he was relying on accurate oral tradition of what Jesus did and said. And we find that about a wide variety of fairly mundane topics like paying taxes. Paul talks about what Jesus said. Doesn't say Jesus said, but the language is so close to the Sermon on the Mount that it probably came from there. And Jesus teaching in the temple the last week of his life. And he talks about loving your enemies. And he talks about what to do with marriage and celibacy and, and divorce and remarriage and and he talks about various events surrounding his second coming, and the list goes on. But one passage that is probably the most striking of all comes in 1 Corinthians 15. The famous text that we often hear read on Easter. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3, Paul says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, the NIV, which I'm reading from, has a footnote that says that could also be translated, or I passed on to you at the first. And then he goes on to talk about the death and the burial and the resurrection and the eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Christ. What I received, I passed on. Those are verbs in both Greek and Hebrew that when used together in a context like this, suggest technical terms, a reference to the faithful passing on of tradition about something important. And they were of first importance, or at the first. It, it's what Paul early on taught the Corinthians was fundamental, and that probably means it's what Paul was taught, beginning with Ananias in Damascus shortly after his conversion experience on the Damascus Road. These are foundational truths. They're expressed in poetic form. Many have thought this is an early Christian creed or even a hymn. Gerd Ludemann, a German university professor of history and an atheist, wrote a remarkable book called What Really Happened at the Resurrection. He's candid. He does not believe resurrections are possible, so he has to come up with the next best explanation. But he says what one cannot do as a responsible historian is say that this is a late, slowly evolving myth or legend from uh, Greek or Roman context far removed from Israel. You have to recognize that Jesus' disciples within a year or two of Jesus' death firmly believed they had seen the risen Christ in bodily form. Ludeman goes on to attribute it to mass hallucination. But students of mass hallucination tell us that where multiple people over periods of time claim to have seen the same appearance of someone or something, it is always, without exception, in the context of some existing fixed object, a painting or statue of the Virgin Mary or of Christ or of a god of some other religion or, or something more mundane. They never appear independently to large numbers of people apart from some object that fixes people's gaze upon it. And yet that's what Ludeman has to postulate to explain the resurrection. What's my conclusion? You asked me to address the question, why should I believe the Gospels are true? I tried to give 12 answers. If you want more information, there's a book. If you don't want that much more information, and it has to be online, go to tgc.org, the Gospel Coalition. Under their Christ on Campus initiative, search for my name. Put only one O in Blomberg. Don't confuse me with the mayor of New York. <laughs> and you will see an article that sketches out what I've presented to you here, Jesus of Nazareth, how historians can know him and why it matters.
But the short conclusion is faith is reasonable. We cannot prove every last detail in the Gospels. We cannot prove every last detail in any work from more than a few generations ago. Historical evidence doesn't permit us to do that. There has to be a step of faith. But it's not a leap into the dark. It's not an absurd step. It's an eminently rational step to take. No matter who says otherwise at whatever university might happen to be near or far. Will you pray with me about this? Father, so many in our world, it seems, are just willing to grasp at straws and, and believe all kinds of unsubstantiated claims so that they don't have to come face to face with you and And scripture and yet you hold out the most amazing prospect of eternal life bringing us peace that transcends circumstances of this life and a glorious and joyous and amazing eternity with you and the company of all the redeemed free from all the sins that beset us now Lord, open, open the eyes and hearts of so many who we want to join us in that forever family. And if it be your will, we're, we're happy with whatever method you use to bring those people to yourself, but if it be your will to use some of these evidences as you've done with various folks in the past. Help us to know them and understand them and represent you and your word well enough that we are not one of the stumbling blocks for them from coming to faith. Whatever that means for the unique circumstances and situations of each person here this morning, we pray you will work in their hearts for their betterment and for your glory, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.